what's going on in terms of bad actors, um, what you're finding, how pervasive it is, and what publishers and marketers are trying to do around that? So the interesting thing is that it's not necessarily bad actors right now that are posting misinformation. There is probably some of that as well, but because it is such a fast moving situation and things get outdated really quickly, you are just happening to find um, sort of misinformation posted by a lot of times well-meaning people who are just uninformed. Um, so the platforms themselves have taken kind of unprecedented steps in order to fight misinformation um, because this is a global pandemic um, and the stakes are really high. If people have the wrong information, that can lead to more sickness and more death. Um, and we saw that uh, Facebook, Google, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Reddit, along with Microsoft and Google, actually issued a joint statement last week saying that they are banding together um, in order to fight misinformation. And that's something we haven't seen before. And that's on top of a lot of individual measures that they've been taking. Facebook provided the World Health Organization with as many free ads as they wanted, took down ads by companies that were trying to exploit the situation by claiming they had a cure for the virus, for example. Um, and Facebook has also pinned all of the information, the, the coronavirus information, to the top of the newsfeed where it's easy for users to access. So a lot of what they've been doing has really been focused on kind of promoting this good information and making sure it's really easy for users to find, as well as demoting or removing uh, misinformation, all three of which are part of their normal tactics uh, to fight misinformation. It's just been done um, cohesively and to a much greater degree. So is it possible at all to quantify how much uh, bad and misleading information is there on social media? I mean, uh, I'm not sure how that would be, how you would qu quantify that, but what what's sort of your, your view on the scope of it? I mean, I wish I had hard numbers to share with you, I don't. I can tell you that there was a stat from Sprinkler um, which looked at the number of coronavirus mentions on, I believe it was March 11th, um, but at least sometime in mid, uh, early to mid-March, across blogs, social media, and publishers, and found that there was 19 million in just one day. And now compare that to how many mentions there were of President Donald Trump on the same day, you can see that it was a lot more, there was only 4 million. So understanding how much of that is good information and how much of that is misinformation is really difficult, but I think it is safe to say that a large share of that was at least outdated, if not uninformed, just because of the nature of the situation. Jasmine, do you expect that this sort of experience that the social networks are going through now and the work they're doing will have implications uh, you know, beyond the crisis uh, around other forms of misinformation? Obviously, there is an election coming up. Um, what do you think some lessons could be learned? So, I, I mean, first I wanna say that it's easier to rally resources around a pandemic than it is around political or socially debatable content. I mean, viruses don't know any boundaries, they don't know any party affiliations. And now when we're in this age of alternative facts, it's very, very hard to draw hard lines around political content without appearing partisan. So it kind of makes sense that they've been able to take these unprecedented steps um, against coronavirus. I do think it will have implications in the future as well. I mean, we've seen that they have been successful at promoting this good kind of information. So why aren't they doing that in other, for other topics as well? Um, and then we've seen that they've been relying very heavily at this point on um, artificial intelligence tools with a lot of their content moderators working at home. And that seems to be sort of the, the way in which we're going in terms of the fight against misinformation, relying much more heavily on automation in the future. So I feel like these are, these are things that we could see coming out of this um, as we talk about misinformation as a whole. And Jasmine, other things that you're looking at that you think are interesting uh, that you could share with us, and some implications for, around digital media and this uh, pandemic? So one thing I've been looking at is sort of the advertising implications, um, both in terms of content of ads and where advertisers are spending their money. And I think that, you know, during this time, um, when we're all cooped up at home, people are spending more and more time on digital media, whether it's to be informed or to be an, an entertained. 
But even as we're spending more time, we're actually seeing advertisers start pulling back some of their spend on these digital platforms. I think this is going to negatively impact their revenues, at least in the short term, um, Q1 and Q2. Um, that's happening kind of all across the board. But on the content side, um, what is interesting is I've been seeing a couple of different studies that consumers are actually very receptive to advertisers mentioning or referencing COVID-19 in their messaging, which um, is more so than for other sort of social topics. Uh, they tend to say that um, only brands that have a, that it, it's authentic to them to talk about a specific topic should be mentioning that in their messaging, but seems that more across the board, people want to know where brands stand on COVID-19 and what they're doing um, to sort of help the situation. 